everybody. Thank you so much for, for waiting. We appreciate um, your patience. I'm going to turn to Mr. Larson. Thank you. And uh, I've looks like I'm uh, the only one left. Uh, unless no one else shows up, I'll just take about 30 minutes, if you don't mind, Madam Chair. Um, and I'll be very try to be brief here. Uh, General Renward, I want to chat with you about um, the other border. Um, uh, the uh, U.S. Canadian borders, uh, obviously, and specifically with uh, with regards to the 2010 Winter Olympics, which will be held in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, obviously in another country, but uh, only about 10 miles uh, north of uh, the U.S. Canadian border, and right across from uh, from what is my district. And I know uh, U.S. Northcom and DoD have had a supporting role in some of the preparation for uh, security for the Olympics. And I just wanted to. Uh, ask you uh, what you see the role and function of U.S. Northcom with regard to the Olympics and what role you have played and missions you have played. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that question. Uh, actually, there are, I have roles in two hats. Uh, in my NORAD hat, uh, as you know, we provide for air security and sovereignty for both the U.S. and Canada. And we've had a very close uh, relationship with the, um, uh, the security, the integrated security unit uh, formed by the Governor of Canada, Government of Canada to ensure that we have the pieces in place to provide for a safe, secure um, monitoring of the airspace in and around uh, not just Vancouver, but as you know, Seattle and the, and the traffic and transit across uh, the border back and forth each day, not just with the Olympics, is substantial. And so we have been involved uh, very actively through our Canadian air defense sector and my Canadian NORAD region to understand the challenges that the Canadian government feels it has with respect to, to a secure airspace. We are partnering with Transport Canada, with the FAA, with our NORAD regions both in the, in the U.S. and in Canada to ensure that we've created procedures that will allow for um, safe transit flow of, of, of aircraft in and out of the area and to monitor the area uh, in, the airspace around that area, low altitude to high, for any potential um, uh, threat. In, in my NORTHCOM hat, uh, as, as you may know, we have a uh, civil assistance plan that we've ag um, agreed to between my counterpart in Canada, Canada Command and Northern Command, to allow us to uh, have a framework that will that could provide military support should it be requested by either of the governments, and and I would use uh, a great example, uh, Hur Hurricane Gustav, where really the last evacuees we took out of New Orleans were on a Canadian C-17. So we've exercised that process um, already. Uh, with respect to um, NORTHCOM support, really we, we sit in um, a situation where uh, the Canadians clearly need to, to lead and manage and are managing their uh, support to the Olympics. There may be some unique capabilities that, that don't reside within the Canadian military. The Canadian government is considering those potential needs and, and will provide that through a diplomatic note from the ambassador to the U.S. government, and then we are in a position and, and be prepared to provide whatever support may be required. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. General Mattis, uh, good to see you again, <coughs> sir, and hopefully the Zags will do a good job tomorrow night. We're all cheering for them and the Huskies. Um, can I ask you some questions about NATO, your, your role as NATO transformation, um, if that's all right? Um, last week we had a hearing uh, about the economic crisis and its impact on national security. One of the themes was that the, uh, the economic recession globally would have an impact on our allies' ability to meet the, their own defense budget needs. And um, uh, are, are, are you, are you are you running into a, pro a problem as you're with your NATO hat on uh, with our allies and their investment into, into their transformational capabilities? Sir, I am, but it is not uh, a late breaking thing that I can attribute directly to the economic uh, turndown. Uh, this was a big enough concern for me when I arrived there at, uh, at JFCOM Allied Command Transformation a little over a year ago that we started a multiple futures project in an attempt to try to harvest from the best think tanks in Europe 
and, the, and North America, what are the threats to the populations and come to some agreement on what is the threat to Europe because if we don't come to an agreement on that, then to try and get, get them to uh, perhaps carry a more equitable share of the load, uh, I think was going nowhere and, and we continued to see declining defense budget. So I, I think there's a larger issue at stake, frankly, and it's something that we're going to have to engage upon uh, through the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, already going on, by the way. But we need to get the military appreciation of the situation sufficient that the political leadership know what we think is the threat. And we are, I should report that out to my boss in Brussels, the Secretary General, within the next 30 days, right after the summit. Uh, Madam Chair, just two questions for the record, and I'll, I'll submit these for the record. One for General Mattis um, about uh, perhaps a change in, uh, in who is going to be sitting in as Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, if possibly, if possible, might be the French in their new, new role in NATO. And, uh, and second, I'll have questions for the record for General Gord and Savridis on uh, 1206 and 1207. And uh, we'll get those uh, to you all uh, um, r relatively soon. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Mr. Lamborn. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, General Renuart, could you please provide an update on the security upgrades being made to Building 2 at Peterson Air Force Base? Uh, certainly, Mr. Lamborn. It's good to see you, and Mr. Kaufman, also good to see the, the Colorado delegations, almost the last two standing, so uh, well done. Um, with respect to it, 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 Congressman Lamborn, you know uh, we have um, – uh, been involved in a in a number of improvements in in, in, uh, in to to expand the security uh, protection, if you will, of our of our operations in, in uh, so-called Building Two, our NORAD Northcom Command Center. Um, we have completed now um, um, a, about four and a half to five million dollars worth of projects since uh, we had the chance to chat last. They include. Um, improvements to the entry access procedures. We've, um, we have created a, a dedicated um, de Department of Defense security guard uh, force now that is trained and equipped. Uh, we have added uh, additional uh, fencing, uh, access control, vehicle control, vehicle inspections uh, to, uh, to our security procedures so that we would uh, reduce the potential for someone uh, with um, with uh, a, a threatening intent to uh, gain access to the building. Uh, we have a couple projects that are just uh, still underway, continuing to work. Uh, one involves the uh, uh, electrical access in the building. Uh, one involves the uh, provision of electromagnetic hardening. I'm sorry, Mr. Bartlett's not here, but uh, we're improving that electromagnetic hardening in the building. Um, and we continue to work with the wing to find additional security measures that the host wing can take to ensure that we don't have that kind of access to the building that might cause us a threat. Uh, thank you. Now, what role do you envision for Cheyenne Mountain Air Force Base in the future? Well, uh, Congressman, as you know, we, uh, we continue to use Cheyenne Mountain as our, our alternate command center. Uh, it has played an active role. As a matter of fact, uh, while we were doing some minor construction in the primary command center, we, uh, we moved our uh, operation to the mountain and, and have conducted full-up operations out of the mountain, um, although, as you know, it's at a small, slightly smaller footprint. Um, we continue to have um, a rotating um, um, presence of uh, assessors and, and command and control capability in the mountain. Uh, and we will continue to do that for the foreseeable future. So I think Cheyenne Mountain will continue to have a, a principal role in our overall command structure, uh, albeit uh, principally as the alternate command side. Okay, thank you for those answers, and I look forward to continuing a dialogue with you on these important issues. Absolutely, and, and thank, thank you. you for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lambar. Mr. Kaufman? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, General Mattis, it's, uh, we obviously have uh, used a pretty large uh, conventional uh, footprint uh, when it comes to um, regime change and, and, and then nation building uh, and use the counterinsurgency strategy. Um, but, I, but we also have insurgency capability 
uh, and special operations and our ability to go in and align ourselves with an indigenous peoples uh, that share our strategic view in terms of regime change or uh, trying to influence a political situation in a given uh, region. Um, can, you, uh, can you for us uh, uh, speak to an assessment of our capabilities in terms of insurgents on, on that side of insurgency? Mr. Kaufman, uh, it would be best if Admiral Olson, my ship made it Special Forces, Special Operations Command, gave it. However, I can, I can uh, perhaps address at least some of the edges of this. We have never had a more integrated Special Forces, General Purpose Forces effort in our history. Uh, they are so embedded now in each other. They, they have, in many cases, uh, the same capabilities, uh, and where they're not the same, uh, the unique capabilities are used back and forth appropriately by the, the combatant commanders. Uh, the uh, special forces are heavily used right now, and the result is we have got to come up with a better uh, allocation of resources, of enablers. For example, from the general purpose forces that enable the special forces to operate. At the same time, we have got a very well-defined division of labor, having sat down with Admiral Olson of Special Operations Command, Chief of Staff of the Army, Commandant of the Marine Corps, and myself, and we look at when we're going to try to do these things before we have to send in large footprints of general purpose forces, who should do it? Let me tell you what the breakout is in general terms. If we're going to set long-term relationships with indigenous forces, with other nations, that's going to be special forces. It will remain there, the Army, uh, a teams, the kind of people who are trained to do this, where it's going to be teaching skill sets, marching, marksmanship, first aid, basic infantry tactics, the general purpose forces will pick those up so that we free the special forces to do what they only alone can do best, if that uh, gives you somewhat of an answer, I hope. Thank you, General Mattis. Uh, General Ward, uh, in AFRICOM, uh, what is, uh, 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 your role or the role of AFRICOM, uh, is there a role in Darfur, um, uh, indirect or direct, potentially direct, obviously no direct role right now, but maybe you could speak to that. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, clearly, our role in Darfur today is that of an indirect nature as we support those African Union, the United Nations uh, forces that are there, that are uh, have been designated to go there, enabling them, training, equipping to a degree, as well as providing logistic support. Uh, I mentioned uh, you know, in January, February timeframe, we provided lift assistance to the government of Rwanda to move uh, outsized cargo, essentially trucks that they would use in the mission there in, in uh, Darfur. And so we are involved with those nations. We're involved with the African Union as uh, they endeavor to put their plans in place for addressing uh, the situation in Darfur. Clearly, you know, whatever we would do would be a result of a policy decision having been taken with respect to the role that we play. And as you pointed out to this point, that is purely a role uh, from the military point of view of providing assistance to those peacekeeping forces that have been uh, earmarked for, for uh, peacekeeping activities in Darfur. Would a correct assessment be that things have deteriorated recently in Darfur? I think from the standpoint of the indictment and the reduction in the non-governmental organizations that are allowed to operate in Darfur, uh, it would in certainly indicate a, a degradation of what goes on there. Not been there, obviously, so I can't speak to it directly, but clearly the indications are that's the case. Uh, I think at this point in time, uh, you know, the, the pipeline distribution issues are, are, are there with respect to supplies, uh, foodstuffs, uh, water, et cetera. So I think uh, it would be fair to say that there has been a degradation of the humanitarian relief effort there in Darfur. Okay. Admiral, I think it was expressed uh, uh, during the discussion about uh, Hezbollah presence uh, in your battle space. Uh, could you speak to that and assess uh, the threat level? Yes, sir. Um, I'll, I'll afford myself, if it's appropriate, the opportunity to provide for the record classified portions of this. But as a general proposition, I'm concerned about the presence of Hezbollah throughout the Americas in the southern cone of South America, in the Indian Ridge, and in the Caribbean. Their primary activities are proselytizing, recruiting, money laundering, drug uh, 
selling and using the profits from that to conduct a, a variety of, uh, of, of the other activities that I mentioned. Um, it's of concern. I do not see operational terror cells in the region, but I do see that kind of support mechanism. It's of concern, and I'll again provide some more detail to the committee on that. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Madam Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Mr. Franks? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, General Renoir, I, um, I have been hearing lately that you have been quoted, uh, I think very accurately, as saying that uh, our um, missile defense capability, as it is now, our present capability, is uh, that you have confidence that it's an effective defense against the present threat from North Korea. And that's a perspective that I share. Um, one of the, the concerns that uh, some of us have is that uh, I think what we have 20, 26 GBIs now in inventory and there's question related to the 18 remaining that uh, we're hoping to put in inventory soon. And because I'm like a lot of, of, of other people concerned about uh, the, uh, the need to have as many uh, GBIs in inventory as possible related to potentially, you know, a growing North Korean threat, and even at some point, I know it'd be more from the East Coast for the time being, but the Iranian uh, missile threat continues to, to grow. And um, so just from a strategic perspective, what do you think the strategic implications are of, of uh, not fulfilling the, uh, the inventory, of filling the inventory to, the, to a total, I believe it would be a 44? Um, do you, do you what do you think your strategic implications of either delaying that or failing to follow through with those 18 additional GBIs? Well, thank you. <coughs> I, I think it's, it, uh, as you say, I, I have expressed confidence in the capabilities that we have today against the threat that we see. I think it's important for us to continue the robust testing regimen that uh, General O'Reilly has laid out. Um, that will allow us to grow the level of confidence we have against a variety of capabilities that might develop in the future. Um, I have uh, been supportive of that, um, uh, as you mentioned, the, um, the planned buy of, of 44 interceptors. I think that makes um, very good sense to allow us to not only maintain a capability against growing threats, but also to refresh missiles as they may need to be uh, upgraded in terms of software and the like. So um, I, I continue to be supportive of that, of that initial plan. Uh, I think there is still quite a bit of discussion ongoing now um, with respect to a European basing site that, that I'm really not in a position to have an expert opinion on. Um, and so I would, m my, my advocacy, if you will, is to keep the current uh, testing s uh, program, the regimen on track, to continue to, to um, make it a complicated all, uh, sort of all aspect testing program so that we're continue to be comfortable that as threats may develop, as other nations, rogue nations, might expand their capability, we have an ability to answer to that. Well, thank you, sir. I guess, uh, you know, I, I had the privilege of, of uh, being present uh, last night at the uh, Missile Defense Agency when one of these tests was uh, conducted, when they had the, the down in the Pacific, they, they shot uh, uh, a missile about 200 plus kilometers into the air, and they sent from our THAAD system right. uh, two interceptors. Uh, the second one was not necessary, and I just thought it was a great moment for America, as so many of these things are, and yet uh, a lot of times the armed forces don't get the credit that they deserve, so, you know, so nobly deserve in these situations. You, even when there's not a war going on, you guys are always out trying to make us stronger and more capable of defending this country, and I honor you for that with all of my heart. And uh, I, uh, I, I get, again, you don't get the credit. I think that should be all over the news today that, uh, you know, uh, we, don't, we no longer hit, as General Oberlin says, a bullet with a bullet. We hit a spot on the side of a bullet with a bullet on a consistent basis. And that is an accomplishment. And I think that that uh, uh, means that my two little babies are going to be safer. And I appreciate you for protecting them. So I got about one last shot at you here. Yes, sir. Um, given the fact that we have a, essentially our firing doctrine is three on one. Uh, related to the Korean threat, or at least we want to be prepared for that. That would give us really right now a chance to only effectively engage eight missiles. And again, that's, a, 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 I know, a rough uh, analysis. Um, but I, 
Is there anything else that you would say related to the strategic necessity of having additional interceptors? Do you think that's, that's important? What, what, what uh, emphasis would you put on that? Well, Congressman, I, I'm glad that, uh, that you first had a chance to see that THAAD test. It really was a, a great Thank success. You. And I think what that does is it also underlines the fact that uh, missile defense is not just about the ground-based mid-course right. interceptors. It is a uh, comprehensive approach from the warning sensors that we must use, air, sea, space-based uh, um, uh, uh, sensors, radars, if you like, in, in simple terms, um, to a both a long-range and a theater capability to defend. And certainly the Navy's SM-3 aboard our Aegis cruisers, the uh, THAAD system that you saw tested so successfully, as well as the ground-based mid-course interceptors provide us a, um, a comprehensive capability. And I think it's important for us to continue that integrated approach. How that translates to numbers of missiles, uh, I think we don't know yet because uh, as the capabilities of each system mature, you may see trade space amongst each of those systems to allow you to have the most efficient uh, capability to defend the nation. I think, uh, as you said, um, the capability against the limited threat we see today, we're in good shape. I, 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 I would not tie to a particular shot doctrine because as the system matures, the system will actually do some analysis right. to determine how best to, to, to intercept one of these incoming missiles. So. Um, I think, again, we have a good commitment to uh, this production rate. Um, my sense is the department is supportive of that, so I don't, I'm not worried about that at this point. But I think we need to let this testing regimen um, complete itself before we tie ourselves to some number uh, that, that may not actually be needed or, or maybe there's more, hard to say. Okay. Well, Madam Chair, thank you. I know that they don't put four stars on the shoulders of these in individuals uh, casually, so I thank all of you for your really committing your whole life to the cause of human freedom, and uh, I, I wish we could really see more of what you do sometimes. I think it would mean a lot to the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Franks. And um, as we wind up, and I want to thank you very much uh, as well, can I just go back to a second? Um, to our comments earlier about irregular warfare. And I'm wondering if you have any message to the personnel committee in what we should be focusing on in terms of the recruiting, ret um, re retention, and training of our military that will continue to support uh, the goal of, of having a superiority in irregular warfare as well as su superiority in conventional and nuclear um, technology. Can you respond quickly? Anything? Yes, ma'am. Uh, just very quickly, you, none of us can predict the future, and we all have certain uh, modest expectations about whether or not we'll really know where the next threat comes from. But we know this. Uh, if we keep a very high-quality force, officer and enlisted, if we keep recruiting the, uh, the kind of folks who can think on their feet, uh, the kind of folks who can integrate high technology but not lose sight of the fact that human factors in war remain the dominant reason for s success or failure, then we will make the adaptations, for example, in language training, cultural training, and these sorts of things. But it really comes down to one fundamental premise, and that is that we get the best and the brightest for these jobs. We are decentralizing decision making, and as we look at the cyber threats and the EMP note that was made earlier, we are going to have to continue to decentralize decision making. That means we need at the very youngest ages, young folks who can use initiative and exercise good judgment, both tactically and ethically, because of the nature of these fights. It's all about quality, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, if I could General, add yes. a, a point. Um, one of the keys to, um, if you will, preventing irregular war is the ability to build partnership capacity among our friends around the world. And I, while certainly Jim is right, uh, the today's, uh, today's young men and women are eager to serve and they understand the technical nature uh, of the business, I think it's important for us to continue that, uh, that capability to build partnership capacity among our friends so that countries can manage those irregular threats that may develop without it requiring a large U.S. presence. And, and, and may, oh, I'm sorry, Kip, go ahead. 
and, and just not to let that one uh, not go without another strike. Uh, and that whole regard of building the capacity of our partners, clearly our cultural understanding is critically important. The, the language programs are within my command, my director of intelligence and knowledge development, whereby we try to have our best understanding of our partners, their culture, environment, history, traditions, et cetera, et cetera. Those things help with those relationships, helps with the partnerships that we build, increases the trust and confidence between us, and therefore helping to get to the point that was made, create the type of environments that would in fact prevent the irregular requirements from even existing. Thank I'll, you. I'll Admiral? just close, if I could, um, by underlining language and culture very specifically. And I believe there are enormous second order effects uh, having two million people in the Department of Defense studying and learning language and culture. It's a ripple effect, both in the world and in our own country. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to working with you as we all face those difficult decisions and choices, and we hope to put more of our resources in that direction. Thank you very much for being here. Again, we applaud your service, and uh, thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.